All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Minister Revealed. It is January 1st, 2024. So today, of course, is a big happy new year 2024 to all of our brothers and sisters around the world. And let's make it clear. It is happy last Gregorian New Year, just to make it clear for those who are wondering. Yes, we know it's a Gregorian year, but man, does it ever bring more hope, more excitement in knowing 2024 is the year we believe that the scriptures have revealed and we are looking to the true Feast of Weeks. We know it to whatever year it's going to be, it will be Feast of Weeks, but the scriptures, I believe, have revealed for which we have shown that 2024 to the end of 70 in Jerusalem to the destruction at the end that the end of days will begin the true final generation and the end of days I believe will begin in 2024 at the true feast of weeks and with that I want to bring this topic up because this has been something difficult as watchmen, right? People have been watching for 2,000 years. The disciples, when they, when they understood Mark 13 in their time, they believed it was happening. And they thought the time was at hand. They said, Lord, isn't now when you will restore Jerusalem? It still wasn't yet. Over and over and over throughout the centuries and the last two millennium, it still wasn't the time. But. The time will come. The world had to be at a certain place, at certain events taking place. A certain amount of time had to pass by. Revelation had to be understood. Things had to take place. And when you consider how blessed we have been, I don't mean you guys. I mean all of us, me included. Over the last six years and change with, with the hundreds and hundreds of revelations that continue to confirm each other one after the other after the other from in the beginning to the end of revelation it's astounding it is absolutely astounding but is it a hard road of course it can be a hard road absolutely it can be a hard road and i'm going to touch on some of those as we get going here i'm going to do my usual opening but i'm going to touch and begin on some of that and remind us all of the reason why and where we are right now and show these enemies and their timing and and why these enemies will be will be believed even by elites you know i had a great conversation one of our brothers isaiah i had seen him show up in the forum i want to say maybe a year year and a half ago and i didn't know he had been with us since like the third video in this ministry i couldn't believe it so he had a question he wanted to share with me and uh, we ended up i knew it was going to be more than 10 minutes it ended up being like three and a half hours of talking. And I always pinch myself because I can't believe I keep forgetting when I do, when I have talks with brothers and sisters uh, over the phone or in particular on uh, Zooms, I keep forgetting to record. You know, I would ask them. I wouldn't just do it without them knowing, but I keep forgetting to record. And this was one that I really wished I had recorded because it was a great, great conversation for three and a half hours, a little bit more detail, more questions coming up and more things to dig into all about this timing when the, when the Lord gets his throne and awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. So, you know, but, but within this, you know, it just reminded me also of, you know, the struggle, you know, the struggle that we're in, but the joy that we get in digging into his word as brothers and sisters all across the earth, because of the internet, because of YouTube, we're able to gather together and share. And so I want to remind, I want to strengthen, I want to give understanding and open more eyes, open more ears. The Lord will do it, the Spirit will do it, but hopefully the words and, and the understanding and the sharing and the love will come through and it will be received. And that we can understand why this is happening and that we can be ready, that we can be ready for this year because as i get into it it's all about the laodicean age remember that it's all about the laodicean age 
and we are in it now. Even though we know it's coming again, where it will be far worse, we are in the Laodicean age of this one, and it's coming to an end. So if you think that things are going to be rosier and prettier and easier as we're coming to the tail end of the Laodicean age, you haven't understood. All right? So we're going to get into this, and we're going to hammer this out. Let's get into this opening part. As always, because if there are new people, and there's generally always new people at some point that will watch, you're going to hear things you've never heard before. You're going to hear things like 14 years of tribulation. You're going to hear of a portion called above, which is a period of time, 50 days before the 14 years begin. You're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to, and all of these things are going to make your head spin. But I promise you this. If you will come into this playlist link right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series, and watch the first four videos, it will all begin to make sense and open up to you. Because the differences that are hidden in the Gospels or the differences that people have thought were contradictions in Scripture, they are not contradictions. You're going to see for your very own eyes that they are all about prophecy. And you're going to see that Luke's discourse is the portion above a pre-trib and this period of time. You're going to see that Mark's discourse is to seals, which is seven years of seals, of which the great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year of seals. And then Matthew's is to the seven years of trumpets to which the Lord returns at the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets feet down on the Mount of Olives. Luke's is the pre-trib above at the beginning of those 50 days right before it starts the pre-trib happens. You're going to see with your very own eyes revealed in Scripture that pre, mid, and post are all true. They are Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And in those synoptic Gospels, it's the differences in them that reveals it. And then you'll understand that the end of days is truly a portion of time called above and 14 years in the exact typology as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So you can come and watch. There's, uh, I think, well, there's 12 videos in this one, but it's the first four that begin to unlock it for you. The first one is an intro for the next three. The second and the third are 30 minutes each, and they're an intro Bible study of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, and then the revelation of the 14 years that becomes known through the revelation of the differences in the Gospels. And then the fourth one is a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes, and it's all it's called It's All About Matthew. And the reason we hadn't yet understood is, one, because it wasn't yet the time, and two, because everybody's foundation on earth for hundreds of years has been founded from the Gospel of Matthew, and we were only told to look to Mark and to Luke in the Synoptic, Gospel, in the, in the Synoptic Gospels as add-on, as a little, you know, we can go there for other points to fill in the gaps. Well, in the revelation of the end, it's way beyond that. It's all three of them, and you will understand that in these videos. The, the other place you can see it, so not only here on YouTube, you can also go to ministryrevealed.com, go to the intro page, and on the intro page, the same thing. Just watch the first four videos there as well, and it's the same thing. So with that, brothers and sisters, Welcome to 2024. Here we are. I believe the final year, January 1st in the Gregorian calendar, for which we have only two options, which is either June 14th, very possible, or June 14th because it's the 8th of Savan, or with the two months difference from John to Jesus's, uh, to when John was put into prison, it will either be over on June 4th, or sorry, June 14th, or it will be August 12th, for which I have proven why I believe August 12th. But it does not take away from being on our toes for June 14th. So with that, brothers and sisters, it's an exciting time. We are now in the year. So from the last video, and actually, you know what? Oh, yeah, let's get started on that. So in the last video... This is just a little added point I wanted to put into uh, put out there to you guys. So in Joel chapter 2, which we've shared was, and we've known for a while, 
that Joel chapter two from chapter one, it's the it's the above the time where Christ is here for 40 days. We know that chapter two is the end of seals. Chapter three is the end of trumpets. And we showed how the former reign moderately in the definitions means teacher of righteousness. So the Lord has given you the teacher of righteousness first, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter, which is Jesus. And what had happened was one of our sisters, um, uh, uh, Faye, I believe she's from Jamaica, and she emails me every once in a while. She showed me her translation. She sent me a picture, and I just about fell out of my chair because until this last video, having done a study and seeing that it was there, I had no idea the name Teacher of Righteousness was literally written in Scripture and not kind of covertly written like this. You want to see it? Check this out. This is from, uh, I think it's called Translations, but I'm going to show you others. Here it is right here, Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 23. You, uh, and you children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your Elohim, for he shall give you the teacher of righteousness and shall cause the rain to come down for you, the former and the latter as before. They literally have the name in many of the translations or in a number of the translations. I went and did a search and I found out that there are six of them. I think six of them. I could be wrong of the translations that I saw. Here's the literal literal standard version. And you sons of Zion, be glad and, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the teacher of righteousness and causes the shower to come down to you, the early, uh, the early rain and spring rain as in the beginning. See that? As in the beginning. This is really important because this is actually going to connect to things that we'll be sharing today uh, in, near the beginning of it, talking about the beginning. And what's really wild about it is... When you read this, the early rain and the spring rain as in the beginning. Well, we know when the end of day starts, we know it starts as it does in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning. Because we know it's a prophetic picture of Christ anointing a group of people who he's prepared, who will be given the rest of the revelation. That's who he talks to at the beginning. We're going to touch on that in a moment, but remember from uh, Luke chapter 12, he tells a group of people who are the Smyrna group, he informs them before, right before the pre-trib happens. And what is this connected to, guys? Laodicea. Laodicea is a prophetic picture of him coming at that point and him having said these things to the church that is unprepared and asleep, thinking, I'm rich, everything's fine, and everything's honky-dory. And what does it tell you? He is the beginning. So we know that the beginning, so he's coming as he did in the beginning. So he's the, there's the teacher of righteousness, right? He's coming, and he's the, the teacher of righteousness is here. And when, the, when he comes as the beginning, who is he informing? He's informing the Luke group, the Luke 24 remnant worker bride that we shared about in the last video and, and many other times. He's the one that's, he's, then the Lord's going to open their understanding and complete the picture for them. And they're going to be the ones working during seals with the teacher of righteousness. And then the Lord, who is the former and the latter coming down to you, that's when he comes at the end of six years of seals, who is the early rain and the spring rain as in the beginning. As the beginning of what? It's the beginning of what? When he came to the group with the teacher of righteousness, the remnant workers. It's awesome. It's awesome. And, and how can we show this? And the, the purpose of today's video isn't to go into this and to rehash this anymore. It's just that as in the beginning is connected, like it says in the first month in the King James. The real more accurate one and the way to say it would actually be, where are we? Uh, Joel chapter two would actually be to say in the beginning or as in the beginning. Watch this. See, it says in the first and then month was added. But should have said as in the first. And there shouldn't be the month. You know, that's where a word was added that they weren't sure. And they believe that was the word that they decided with. Right. So it means what? As before, as the beginning, as time of old. 
Okay. It's Christ when he comes down at the end of the sixth year of seals. After he's given, after the father had given the teacher of righteousness and those who remain as the remnant workers with him. Wild stuff. So you're going to see why this beginning and so forth is important as we get going. So, you know, as I said, <clears throat> it's very important for us to remember that being in the Laodicean age is important to remember because you can you can begin to understand the attacks that are happening, the attacks that are happening on you, maybe on family, maybe on friends, because the enemy is working extra hard. He knows the time is near. And when you've got a group of people being prepared, do you think the Lord is protecting and watching over them? Absolutely, 100%. He even tells us in 1 Peter. We know that he is. But if you think that means we can get away unscathed, that we won't have ups and downs, that we won't slip and, you know, have some sin here and there, you, you're, you're crazy. It's not possible. We're still in the flesh. And the enemy wants to take us down. And he has taken some down. And he's got others in a struggle right now. And so we need to, in this year, more than ever, as it will get much more intense, we need to be praying for each other, strengthening each other, lifting each other up, encouraging each other, supporting each other, all of it, more than we ever have before, because it's going to get much harder for the watchmen in the age of Laodicea. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I could not imagine doing this if I didn't have you guys here with me. You know, for those that are new, we have a forum. You can go to ministryrevealed.com, click on the forum link. We've got 1,200 people around the world subscribed in there. People sharing Bible studies, events, uh, uh, global events, prayer requests, all sorts of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can come and join in there for free. Take you a few seconds to sign up. Just click the forum uh, page. Uh, link in the on the website in the uh, menu box <clears throat> so guys that's that's in part what this is and and building it into these events that the enemy and what's taking place as this all begins so we know right now it's hard we need to be reminded that not only is it hard but that it might even get harder you know it, of course it's a roller coaster ride right we, we're we're watchmen there, there's there's responsibility with watchmen. Do you realize that if you're into prophecy, you're seeking scripture and you're seeking the Lord in his scripture and you're you're trying to understand prophecy, whether you're a part of this ministry or another one, but you're into prophecy and seeking it out, watching for the time of the end, you would be in that class of watchmen. And it's not easy for watchmen. The enemy is waiting for you to take a nap. The, way, the enemy is waiting for you to take a break and say, oh, I'll come back. I'm going to go to the washroom. He's waiting for it. He's waiting for that opening to attack. And we've seen it happen. And some are seeing it in an individual personal scale right now. So we want to prevent that. We want to be able to strengthen everybody up. And that's why I'm going to keep doing this for as long as it takes, for as long as he has us here doing it. Okay? Okay. So don't think for a minute, <coughs> excuse me, that now as we come to the end of the Laodicean age, it's not going to get easier or that it is going to get easier. It's going to get much harder. Guys, <coughs> let's go look, for example, at Luke chapter 21. This is the type of stuff that we have to be careful of, right? Luke chapter 21, verse 34, and take heed to yourselves lest that any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Drunkenness and cares of this life. That actually means a drunkenness as well. I've got experience in that, as some of you guys know from the past, right? Who is this talking to, guys? Do you think this is just talking to a bunch of unbelievers? It's in scripture. There's no unbelievers reading this. This is Jesus's words to, to a group pre-trib. 
not to get over not to get o overcharged and cares and, and caught up in the cares of this life. It doesn't mean we don't do the things that have to get done with for our families and for work and so forth. But we can't allow ourselves to be weighed down. And what I mean by that is by weighed down in watching. Sure, things of this life and, and being watchmen can be heavy. But we can't allow that. We can't use that as an excuse to pull away. Because when you do, the enemy comes in. Why? Because you're watchmen. Do you think the enemy cares of the church that is sleeping? Do you think he, he's concerned with those who are unaware? Not really. He's more concerned with preventing those who have understanding, those who are watching, those who are warning and waking people up, those who are going around in ministry like our dear brother Steve and his team in Uganda, like us here who are telling people. And then you get a beatdown because times have come and gone because people don't understand what you're telling them. Even if we're giving them a specific date, don't, maybe don't give them a specific date. Tell them this time frame. And then they can't accuse you of a date. How about that? But we can't allow that type of thing to pull us so far down that we want to turn back or, 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 or pull back a little bit and just take a little break. <clears throat> this is why I said in the, last, uh, in the last several months, the last six, seven, eight months, this is why I said I was so relieved when the revelation was made clear that the Feast of Weeks is the time of year that it will happen, at the true Feast of Weeks. Because after looking, after looking, after looking, after one feast, next feast, this event, that event, that is what weighs on our, on our hearts. That is what weighs on our spirits. And it causes many to go tell people this date, then this date, then this date. And then nobody wants to listen. That gets hard as a watchman. But does it mean it was wrong? No, it was just part of the process. It's part of the process. And it weighs and wears on watchmen. But we can't let it pull us away. We can't use it as an excuse to pull away. It could just mean don't share with them every event. Always be watching. But... Have more of a watched focus on the Feast of Weeks while always being ready. That's why I've been so freed in this past several months. I don't have this weight of it's this one, it's this one, it's this one. I know full, full well, absolutely 100%. I believe I know exactly where it is, whether between whichever one is the absolutely true Feast of Weeks. Do I know with certainty it's this year with absolute 100% certainty? No. With 99.9, .9, yes. But the time of year, I'm absolutely certain. But guess what? Do you know that if it comes sooner or if it comes later, do you know that I'll be ready? I know that most of you will be ready. But will you allow events and, and a watch coming and going to, to bring you down and say, I'm just not going to watch anymore? This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of your eternity. This is a matter of you being a watchman. I don't believe any of us put it within ourselves to be watchmen. I have no idea what caused me to want to be watching and searching for prophecy and seeking it out. I don't think many of you can either. It was put in there from God through the Spirit. We are in a testing ground, guys. That's what this life is, right? Have you, I'm sure you've all asked yourselves that, you know, if this, is, if this is our testing grounds, you know, why? Why? You ever think maybe so that the Lord can show us his love, his mercy, his forgiveness? You ever ask why there was a fall in the first place? Why on earth was there a fall? You ever consider that no one knew the greatness of the Lord? No one knew his true compassion, his mercy, his forgiveness. I just watched this in a video that was shared the other day, and I thought it was fantastic. Without the fall, 
he had a bunch of yes men and those that knew no different, right? You could say like yes men, but they love him and they believed, right? But prior to that, without the testing of the flesh in, in this earth for us, nobody would really know the true love of the Lord. His mercy, his forgiveness, his kindness, his grace. That's what we've been given. So when the when eternity comes, we will be forever eternally grateful. It's wild stuff, man. We are here to choose whether we believe he is good always, regardless of the situation, or if he isn't. And of course, I'm preaching to the choir. Of course, I know you guys all know that he's good. Not always easy to remember that, though, is it? In the midst of trials. But we have to remember, he's either good sometimes, or he's not good, like, not good at all, or he's always good. And he's always good. We need to remember that. And he's chosen us. And we've chosen to be with him. So we have to accept these things that come along the way. And especially as watchmen, and especially in this Laodicean age. We're in the battle of the ultimate evil against the ultimate good. And I believe, as you guys have understood, especially revealed in the last video, that we truly are a group of people here, a number of people here in this ministry are a group being prepared for his servant in the his servants in the is to come the battle is over the victory is won right well we know it's won but it's not over yet right and people are falling why are they falling so much now because we're in the Laodicean age. You know, people have told us, oh, uh, it's revival. The greatest revival is about to start the last 40 years. Why hasn't it started? Because we're in the Laodicean age. There is no possible fathoming way you're going to have the greatest revival or a big revival in the midst of the Laodicean age, which is the age of falling away. But you know, that as long as you draw breath, there's still time for repentance. There's still time to come back and to be strengthened. Right? Most of you know my story with alcohol, especially wine. You know, I was unknowingly on the brink of death. I didn't realize it till I was in the hospital getting a blood transfusion and them telling me they couldn't even figure out or understand how I was walking around and still able to talk to them. I can't remember what red or blood cells whatever it is but i was like at a 60 something 67 or something like that which apparently is extremely extremely low and i was given two pint two pints of blood within you know within 30 minutes or so an hour of being brought to the hospital it sure explained the hallucinations i was having for the two the day and a half two days before i went to the hospital they were some wild ones and when i look back on them i mean i am grateful because had i actually died at that time who knows where I'd be? Well, I have a pretty good idea of where I might be. I have a pretty good idea. Was I somebody who called himself a Christian, believed in the Lord? Yes. You know, maybe I would have gone to paradise. But from what I was seeing and what I was hearing, like literally seeing these things in my house, in the backyard, telling my family about it, you know, it, it was bananas. And it didn't strike me that that was me about to go to paradise. So I say this so you guys know, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And it's been a little over eight years, right? It was a little over eight years. And it was at that point when I, that was it. I was done. I knew that I was done with alcohol. I didn't have to go to any AA or do any of those things. I knew that I knew just as I knew the Lord was my Lord and Savior, just as I knew my wife when I married her, just as I knew when I quit smoking cigarettes when I was 24, just as I knew when I quit drinking that I would never do it again. And that was a little over eight years ago. And that moment 
changed my life forever. And if you would have ever asked me, do I think this is where my life would have gone? In a million guesses, I would have never, ever seen this coming. But I want you guys to know, we're not stuck in that, right? I, I hear from people, you know. We have people in this ministry, people that reach out. I know there are people drinking and that it's getting excessive. I know there are some doing drugs. You see? We can't allow these things because we're because we're we're feeling deflated or because things are getting tough or marriage might be difficult. We cannot allow these things to pull us away. We are coming to the finish line and the start line. And we're a group of people being prepared. We can't allow these things to give us excuses because it is the enemy that's doing it. It is the enemy in this Laodicean age working overtime to stop and take away as many as he can. You know, drugs and alcohol are one. There are many other things, but we also know there's perversion as well, right? Sexual immorality. And the reason I bring this one up, although I'm sure there are others that are dealing with things like that, you have to stand up. You have to change the channel. Put your phone down. Read, read a, a, a page from scripture. Go for a walk. Change your thinking before doing the next drink, before taking the next drink, before the next thing with drugs, before that perversion goes the extra step. I don't know if you guys had heard, but that's why I'm also bringing this up. You remember our brother Charles, our old brother Charles? Um, he's fallen badly. You know, he used to be a part of Ministry Revealed. Something had happened. We didn't make it public. Um, it was just people that had asked privately, and I let them know. And Mike and those guys over at 165, they knew uh, what had happened because they were a part of it. And um, Charles was very, very prideful, and he was very, very violently verbal. And so he was cut off and left Ministry Revealed. And he went to go be with Mike and those guys over at Interrupt 165. And they just thought, well, maybe it's just Charles's temper. You know, well, yeah, it's it's violent, crazy words that, you know, I've never heard anybody speak those type of violent words in my life and vile words. But maybe it's just his temper. And they they were giving him grace. And he ended up doing the same thing to them. And this time it was a little bit more public because it was people in their discourse and they had seen it. And then all the info of it, uh, they ended up deleting. So it wouldn't cause too much friction. And then Charles took a whole bunch of people and went to his third ministry. And I was so surprised with the number of people that went because for me, it would have been, well, he was at one, he went to another, and now he's gone to another. You'd have to ask yourself, why? The first one is still there. The second one is still there. Why did he have to go to a third? And he did the same thing, violent outbursts and everything with 165. Now, I'm not somebody who's all holier than thou and just think, oh, I was just praying for him all the time. No, I was upset, man. Of course I was pissed at some of these things. Of course I was. I'm human. We were close for a year and a half, sharing for hours at a time, multiple times a week. So, of course, I was upset. But I also prayed for him. And I know Mike and his team were praying for him as well. But he had to correct his ways. And we were hoping and praying that he had. Well, I just found out two days ago, three days ago, that um, the channel that he had left to go start with others was called uh, The Sword of God. You know, we all, most of us knew about it. And he had a lot of the similar teachings to us, except the opposite side of pre and and on a number of things. It was always he wanted to be first and he was always on the back end of things. And um, the reason, the main reason I'm bringing this up is because of what we're talking about. And the first time it wasn't public. The second time, barely a little bit public. Well, this third time, brothers and sisters, our brother Charles has fallen and his ministry is over. Um. 
it's over. All 500 people that he had on his Facebook are gone. They've all left. On his website that I didn't know he had called the sword of God.net, they've posted on there uh, the sexual immorality that he did uh, with text back and forth listed for everybody to go in and look. Does, I'm not telling you to go and do it unless you just feel you want to see for yourself. And um, with a married woman and enticing them and doing all these different things. And, uh, you know, it was sad. It really is sad. And and I'm not saying this to say, ah, Charles, good for you. You know, you got it, sucker. No, 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 no. He's been caught by the enemy. I My hope and my prayer in this is that he does truly, truly, truly repent. Only the Lord will know his heart at that point. I won't know it. I don't think any of us would know it. Only the Lord will really know his heart if he has fully repented or not. And as of yet, he hasn't. Every other time, he's put his back to the wall and then stepped on the gas. So I pray that that's not the case this time. And there, there are two women that did come forward. I was told that there were two. And, um, you know, it's, it's really sad. And I hope he doesn't start another ministry or try to come up with another channel because even in repentance... I can tell you now his authority that he thought he had is gone. It is gone. I hope he comes back to repentance with the Lord in truly a humble heart. But his time of reaching others is now over. So, guys, you see, this, this was somebody close to us, right, who had been close to us. We need the whole armor of God. We need to pray for each other. Pick each other up, strengthen each other any way that we can and every way that we can in the Lord. And know that we are in the Laodicean age and the enemy is working overtime. There is no break with the enemy. So as watchmen, we must be ready and we must be standing our ground. Here's what I found to share with you guys in relation to watchmen from this uh, website. So it says, a watchman in the Bible were to sound warnings to ancient Israel. Sometimes they were military personnel on the city walls, but more specifically, they took on the role as prophets or, you know, again, it doesn't mean we're saying we're all prophets because we're watchmen. It means we are into prophecy. We are watching, paying attention, sounding the alarm, okay? We're doing the work of reading and understanding the prophets to bring warning, okay? So role as prophets who sounded God's warning to rebellious peoples. Today, the role of watchmen is to have perceptive spiritual eyes through prayer and diligently seeking his word. They observe the signs of the times and convey God's message to a regathered Israel, to the church, and to the secular nations. The message can be one of hope and encouragement in the Gospels, like Steve does, or one of chastising and warning of God's coming judgments. Exactly. Okay? This is what we're doing. Do you know what happened in, the, in ancient Israel? Do you know what happened to those watchmen on the wall if they fell asleep? Let's have a read of this. During the night, the captain of the temple made his rounds. On his approach, the guards had to rise and salute him in a particular manner. Any guard found asleep when on duty was beaten or his garments were set on fire. A punishment, as we know, actually awarded. Set on fire. Their garments would be set on fire, guys. Their garments would be set on fire. I'm sure many of you guys have heard that before. This is why I'm warning why would I do this if I if I wasn't committed, if I wasn't sure, if I didn't believe this was really the time and seeing what's happening to other brothers and sisters? We got to do our best to pick them up, pray for them, strengthen them, right? Convict them in a sense, right? So that they turn from those things. As with Israel's prophets, God's watchmen today are often burdened by what they see and what uh, and they stay close to God in sustained prayer and diligently seeking, okay? 
That's that's what happens with Watchmen. Burdened with what we're seeing, weighted with what we're understanding. Because it's close, and all we want to do is have people see. Like everybody we talk to, just open their eyes, Lord. That's just not the way it happens. They didn't believe him. Why would they believe us? But we'll rejoice in the ones that do, right? That's where the joy comes from. Their role is to convey, to convey truth despite opposition from the world and the apostate end time church. You see, the apostate end time church. Why? Well, because just like the person who wrote this and like most people that study any scripture, they understand we're living in the Laodicean age, the time of the apostate church. To this end, groups of believers often collaborate as watchmen across the globe using the Internet. Bang on, right? It's exactly what's happening. We're a group of brothers and sisters collaborating as watchmen, sharing and strengthening across the globe using the Internet. And doing it in a time of an apostate church. Right? That's the apostate church. Let's go have a look. Let's go into Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea. Laodicea. Uh, Revelation 13, starting in verse 14. And unto, unto the angel of the church of, Laodice of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. Okay, are all these things talking about Jesus? Yes. The amen, the faithful and true witness. Listen to this. The beginning of the creation of God. You see, how many times have we shared on that? We'll be touching on it in today's as well, making some points. The beginning of the creation of God. Well, who is the beginning? We've proven that that's Jesus. I had people give me comments and send me stuff saying, the word beginning, that's not Jesus. So Jesus calls himself the beginning and the end, but he's not the beginning. The word is feast of first fruits. The, the, Hebrew word 7225, which means first fruits of the feet of feast of first fruits. And then we see here in Laodicea, he's actually called the beginning of the creation of God. Well, who do you think that is then? Obviously, that's the beginning. Rings a bell, right? Back to the beginning. He is that beginning. So we know that he's that beginning. We've broken that down. We've understood it. Let's keep reading. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, uh, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because that our, because you are lukewarm <laughs> and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee from my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We know where naked is connected to as well, don't we? You see, in this Laodicean age that we're coming to the end of, it's going to be the very beginning, the very moment of the beginning. And it's also going to be the end, right? That's why the word beginning is here. That's one of the purposes of the word beginning here. Because this word for beginning... Just like when we take it to Genesis 1, is right at the very beginning. What is this very beginning, guys? Right here. It's from Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, knowing these gospels in order, reveals these understandings. And what do we know about it? Verse 35 from Luke chapter 12. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he knocks, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down and eat and he will come forth and serve them. This is the quote unquote first watch. Then if I come in the second or in the third, blessed are those servants. Because there's the pre-trib remnant group 
There's the mid-trib great multitude rapture for which the 144,000 come from, which is trumpets time, at the last year of seals and into trumpets. And then you've got the ones at the end of tribulation that are the ones that go out to teach the people during the millennial reign. This is that group that is part of the beginning. They're connected to in the beginning. They're the watchmen prepared. They're the group with the teacher. When the Lord comes in the beginning, you see, and causes a shower to come down to you. So this is when the rain comes down. This is when the Lord is coming down, who is the, er the, the early and latter rain as in the beginning. Is this in the is or was sense? Is that because it was the beginning back to, to Genesis chapter one? Is, is that what it's telling us? Yes. But what is it prophetically telling us, knowing that Joel chapter two is the end of the six year of seals? He's telling you in the beginning as just before the 50 days began, just before the pre-trib escape began. Who's he coming to inform? In the beginning when he comes. I'm not talking about when he comes to start the 40 days after the wedding. I'm talking about before he leaves for the wedding, before he takes the pre-trib group for the wedding. He's coming to a group girded about with their lights burning to be ready when he comes back from the wedding, knocking, and those servants will he sit with and dine and serve. He is telling this group in what is referred to as in the beginning. So do you know what that does to Genesis 1? Actually, I'll leave it here in Laodicea. I'll just go to this one. You know what that does to, to uh, oh, Genesis 1? You know what that does to Genesis 1? That tells you that this is when he's warning them. Or, or this is when he's telling them to be girded about. That he's about to take the bride. And that this group, that's the remnant group that is remaining, to be ready when he returns and knocks. And that's this part all here. This is like the seven-day wedding, if you will. Because what comes next in verse 3? He's made light. And when he's made light... That's a prophetic picture of him beginning his 40 days. Hello. You see? So in the, in the picture of 2024, it's a matter of saying, okay, <laughs> well, knowing that Jesus was born here in the third month, is this the pre-trib, right? This is your day one. So your pre-trib is going to be somewhere in here which means somewhere in here, right before the pre-trib, he is warning this group from Luke chapter 12. It's, it's the portion called the beginning. He warns them, and then bang, the pre-trib group is gone. And then he would return on the eighth day right here. And this is when he would declare light, when he is coming to shed his light in the darkness, to shine his light in the darkness. All of this, is connected to that remnant worker group and to the portion of his 40 days of warning. The only question is, is it going to be here? Right? Or is it going to start over here? And I, wouldn't, I don't disagree with people that say, well, no, you know what? It really looks like it's here because we're in Savan. We're in Taurus. In the beginning was Taurus. So if in the beginning is Taurus and in the beginning was the eighth day or the 16th day of his resurrection, well, if this is where the bride escapes and this is where then he would return to start his, his days as light, it's possible. Except for the fact that we know there was two months between John's bapt uh, Jesus' baptism and John being taken to prison. And that is a big deal. And that's part of the difference. So there, there's a reason why this is going to be an extremely high time to watch. But if it comes and goes, we will remain strengthened, watching and praying, seeking and searching until this time here. And this time, we've explained fully the reasoning why. And it has far more connections 
than just a start in Taurus because the start must be in Taurus. The start must be in Taurus. But is it a start in Taurus as just right away it starts in Taurus? Or is it the count of seven Sabbaths, then 50 days? And I believe seven Sabbaths and then 50 days, as you guys all know. So, so when we see this here, and we read through this in Luke, and we understand this group of people, let's go back and look at Revelation chapter 13 with Laodicea. We've got the connection to the beginning. We've got the connection even in, 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 in Joel. With telling us that that he's there, that the father had given this anointing through the teacher of righteousness, and that this teacher of righteousness we know has people with him. It's a community of people that are watchmen. They're they're an apocalyptic watchman community. This is that community, or a portion of it. And this portion, which is the Luke 12 portion, there is connected to the beginning, and the beginning is. Exactly where Laodicea begins with, he is the beginning. But do you realize, at this point, we haven't yet clicked over, you see? We haven't yet clicked over to go back to Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. This is not only Laodicea as the age we've been in for several decades. It's also the tail end last moments. Of Laodicea. Look at what he says next. Uh, I said, on slave. Uh, verse 19. For as many as I love. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore. And repent. Behold I stand at the door. And knock. If any man hear my voice. And open the door. I will come in to him. And will sup with him and he with me. Who did we see did that? All right, we've shared on this before. <laughs> Who is that group? Prophetically, in the is to come, it's specifically speaking to a group of people from Luke chapter 12. In the is, you could say, well, it's also just, you know, when he comes to knock on the door of your heart and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. But there's the literal or the is to come. And that literal is to come is this group right here. The one we've taught on so many times. We're then able to prove it not only from this wording, not only from the beginning. But listen to what he says next. In verse 21 of Revelation 3. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Who's the group of, pe of people who would have that type of honor? It would seem some people think that it's, you know, a billion people. There's going to be a billion people sitting in the throne with them, which means what? That they would rule and reign with them. If you're sitting on the throne with the king, then you're reigning with them. But what do we know about a people in the beginning, a remnant portion, watchmen, who are waiting for the knock, who he said to be ready for, and that when he comes, he will open and they will dine with them. This same group we all know. Because what is this? In the prophetic, we're looking at this right now, as the very last moments, I mean literal, I don't mean weeks or days or months, no. I mean the very last maybe minutes, maybe at most a few hours that this is speaking to prophetically. How do we know? Because as soon as the pre-trib bride happens, which would be connected to this time, he's warning that group that he's about to take them. And then bang, he takes a group. And now that group, that he forewarned has to be ready when he returns and knocks. Well, we know who they are. When that moment happens at the pre-trib, we are now in the we are now the seven churches starting over again for the end of days in the is to come. 
and it will begin with Ephesus. This is going to be the beginning of the 50 days of the above 14 years, right after the escape. We know that this is connected to the apostle group that will be anointed at the beginning of the 50 days by the breath of the, of the Lord on the, from the Holy, uh, of the Holy Ghost, right? And during those seven days of the wedding taking place in heaven, the apostles will have their commission to go and do the works that whatever it is that they'll be commissioned to do. And they will remain throughout seals. But when the Lord comes back from the wedding and he returns after seven days on the eighth day, it now begins the church of Smyrna. And who did he warn at the end of Laodicea? Who was he talking about as the beginning? He was talking to this group. It's the same Smyrna group that he warned in advance, as we've told you before. Now we can, we can understand it even more with the word beginning. Because prophetically in Joel, when it says, as in the beginning, he's talking about that moment from um, Laodicea. In the final moments of Laodicea, when he's warning this group. Because Smyrna, as we know, is connected <laughs> excuse me, to when the Lord returns from the wedding. And now it's eight days into the 50 days. And this group of Smyrna, this remnant watchman group, is the group that will also remain during the time of seals. And how do we know that this is that group? Well, one, we were able to connect it to Luke. Right. That first group that he will sit and dine with and eat. That's the only one he does it with. We know it from Luke 24, Luke chapter 12. Right. Uh, Revelation chapter two. But it also said that in that time, it would be them that would rule and reign with him. Right. Or that would sit in his throne with them. Well, if he's king and they're sitting in his throne with them. Or on his throne with them. Guess what happens? They would be reigning with him. Right. And that's how you know it's this group. Because this group in Revelation 2.11, it says, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And we all know that there's only one group, which is that group, which is right here. Those who have put their necks on the line during the time of seals, not having taken the mark and all those other things. That group, even though there will be others Hundreds of millions of others avoiding the mark during the time of seals, avoiding the Antichrist and his system and everything else, and many of them dying. This is speaking of a specific group, which are the Smyrna remnant workers. They were his watchmen group sent out who followed him during the 40 days, were given the, the greater revelation of the end of days understanding for seals, and they were sent as his servants. They were the ones that eat with them that he forewarned before leaving for the wedding and that he comes back when he knocks to sit down and serve them. It's the Smyrna group. You guys all know this. And it's only the Smyrna group that is accounted for right here. It's this group who put their necks on the line. And they lived and what? Reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So it is this group that has part in the first resurrection. Most people, because they don't understand the differences in the Gospels, will never understand that it's speaking to different groups of people and portions of people from each portion of time from the groups. Otherwise, you're going to have, what, uh, 300 million people reigning with Christ on the earth during the millennial reign when there's going to be, I don't know, 500 million people left? Makes no sense, right? Who would who would the other guys going out during the millennial reign have to teach? You see, it's not how it's going to work. It is the remnant group. It is the worker portion from that time. And then it says, but the rest of the dead live not again. Uh, this is the first resurrection. Verse six, but blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. You see, that's why Smyrna mentions that. These are the guys. These are the ones from the beginning. These are the ones from the beginning who received the revelation, who had the teacher, who will be with the Lord for 40 days. Their understanding will be greater opened. 
and they will go out during seals. And then when the Lord comes at the end of seals, when the rain is come down, the former and the latter, as in the beginning. It's crazy how all this stuff connects. It says, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign. There it is again with them a thousand years. What do you see? Rule. What? Like a king. Rule like a king to a group that he, in the last moments of Laodicea, says were part to the connection to him from the beginning. That he would knock on the door when he, when he comes to them, and that if they open, he would sit with them and serve them and sup with them, and that they would get to sit in his throne. This is the final moments. And could you imagine? You know, I think one of the reasons it can be very difficult for us sometimes is not only all the rejection that happens, but really pondering what it is that we've been sharing for the last six years and change. What it really means. I was just talking about this the other day with my kids, maybe with somebody else as well uh, in the forum. But to really ponder what this is telling us. It's easy to forget that what we're actually truly talking about is, is real. It's more real than the screen you're looking at and your hand in front of your face. It's the truth of everything. It's the word. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that. It's almost like, like, we're, like we're drafting a script for this incredible story. But I think we need to pause a little more often, especially this year, to remind ourselves what it is we have been given to understand. Because it's a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. And we can't just set it aside for a little bit because we're uncomfortable, because we're worn. Buck up, you're a watchman. <laughs> Believe me, I'm speaking to myself too. I'm always speaking to myself when I'm speaking these things to you guys too. We need to be strengthened. And that's why we have the forum. That's why I keep doing the videos, to strengthen and to ve reveal more, to encourage, to give more understanding so that we can all be prepared when the time comes. Whether we are so blessed to be accounted worthy, to be in the lowest room of the third heaven, or to be girded about, ready to serve him when he returns from the wedding. It's all about his light, guys. Remember he told these guys, let your lights be girded about? We know that when he comes to begin his 40 days, when he comes to begin his 40 days, we know it's all connected to light, right? Even right here with these guys, he said, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. This is, this is just like our little flames, our, our lights burning within us. Do you know what happens when he comes as the light? Because when he returns from this wedding that he's going to, for those that get to go to the lowest room pre-trib, when he returns, that's when he's bringing his full-on light. Do you, know, do you realize that it starts with light and it ends with light? Makes sense because it's him. Let me show you, and you're going to see why I'm going into light. Let me show you. You guys all know Chapters to Years. For those that don't know, we have some incredible videos on it, but Chapters to Years, here's a picture of it. These are books, Hosea, Zechariah, John, Acts in two forms, Ezekiel, Psalms in two places, Genesis, Hebrews, Exodus, Judges. All of these books have revelation within them of prophetic end-time understanding that relate to years when these events will take place. If the, if the true time isn't 2024 and it begins at trumpets or whatever time in 2024 and then it, and it's 2027, then all of this would just move to 2027. It doesn't change what's revealed in it. It's just about a matter of timing of when it begins, which we believe it will start in 2024. Okay? So all of these books and the Gospel of John 
has 21 chapters. And believe me, it is absolutely for a prophetic reason. And for those that have been around for a while, you guys know that prophetic reason. We've covered it a lot over the years. It's absolutely incredible. Let me show you one example. In John chapter 8, so what would John 8 be? John, uh, John chapter 8 would be like right at that time at the beginning of the 14 years. Okay? I would even say based on the wording and how it's laid out, it would actually still have to be even that little portion above. Listen to how it says, okay? Look at that, 14 chapters left. Jesus went in, went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. You want to know why what really caught me the first time I came across this after all the, the prophetic understanding was being revealed was it reminded me of the coming of the Son of Man, right? It reminded me of the pre-trip. 2136, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now listen to this. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple and in the night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him in the temple for to hear him. Came to him in the temple for to hear him. Sound familiar? Isn't it wild? That the same wording is connected to the beginning of John chapter 8. When our chapters to years is connected to that same period of time. What? Who, who is the group that goes first? The Gentile bride. So the Gentile bride, for those that don't know, a Gentile can also be rever referred to as an uh, quote unquote adulteress. Okay. It doesn't mean to be an adulterer. Like some have done. Okay, that's not what it means. It's connected to Gentiles. For those that haven't seen this before, it's been a while since I shared on it, but let me just make a quick point with it. It means, <laughs> look at the word beginning, <laughs> latter end at the beginning. Um, Where is it? I always mix up which chapter. There it is. So it's the same thing as Ruth. Ruth is the Gentile bride. And I would say Esther, Esther is a picture of the Jewish bride at the end of tribulation. But Ruth is the prophetic beginning one. And listen to what she says. Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Okay? It, she's a Gentile. So seeing that she's a stranger, she's not part of them, right? Not one of them. Look at what it can mean. Foreigner, non-relative, adulteress. Is this because Ruth was an adulteress? Of course not. Okay, it's a it's a prophetic typology that you know because Gentiles, it was all about his people, and then eventually the Gentiles we were uh, uh, we were so graciously grafted in. So we know connected to this time to Luke and verse thirty six of Luke twenty one that the preacher of Gentile bride is being taken, and we see in verse three. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery, a prophetic picture of the bride. And when they had set her uh, in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have, uh, that they might have to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down with his finger, rolled on the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself, lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. We know this is also a prophetic uh, conversation to the stone's throw. OK, this will happen in the midst of that first week, uh, probably meteor in the midst of the beginning of the 50 days. And he stood and he stooped down again and he continued to, to, to write. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. You see, it's this picture of him being on one knee, bent over, writing. And he looks up and only her standing there in the midst. It's a picture of his bride. 
when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto the woman, where are those thine accuser? Hath no man condemned thee? And then he tells her, excuse me, go and sin no more. It's a prophetic picture connected to the beginning at the pre-trib bride of Christ. So knowing this also connected to the beginning, we know that it's the spirit group. We know it's the pre-trib group. We know it's the pre-trib going from Luke 21. What do we see that comes next in verse 3 of Genesis 1? We see that Jesus is made light, don't we? Jesus is then, where are we? Made light. He was the beginning. And now God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Who was this light? For anybody that hasn't been around for a little while, that light is Jesus. We all know that this light is Jesus. See, in the beginning was the word. So who was the beginning and who was the word? Jesus. He is the beginning and he's the word. Okay? And then what does it say? In verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Sound familiar? We have a period of time connected to connected to the the pre-trib the the beginning of the 50 days and the wedding him returning from the wedding at the period of time when he is being made light which is his 40 days starting and here he is being told to us that he was made light and the darkness comprehended it not and who was a witness to that light john was a witness to that light John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist was a witness to that light. Who's the prophetic typology of John during this tribulation of seals? During that, during the beginning and the 40 days. It's the remnant worker group. The ones putting their necks on the line. It's all connected. So who is the true light? Well, of course we know Jesus is the true light. And when he comes to begin his 40 days... What does it say after the typology of the Gentile woman taken at his bride? Look at what it says next. John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There it is again. What's this connected to? John chapter 1 just told us. And John chapter 1 was telling us of Genesis chapter 1. Which means in verse 3, this is the same prophetic picture of when Jesus was made light. Which means verse 3 is a prophetic picture of his 40 days beginning. This is the time of light. His light group. Remember, that whole creation in the days of creation was all about light. Those males and females were light beings. Because they were created in his, in his image. You see? That was the time of beings of light. It had to be. Because that's when he was light. There was no flesh yet. That's when he was light. He is the light of the world. And we've all understood this, right? We even do this to our famous piece from Isaiah chapter 9. Do you think it's by chance that it says the same thing? We know that there's a light affliction that comes in the two northern cities at the beginning of the 50 days. And then it says in Isaiah 9, verse 2, it's a prophetic picture of the Lord coming to begin his 40 days. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them, the light has shined. For unto us a child is born. It's a picture of the birth of Christ. It, it brings us back to think what I was sharing earlier, that can it be this time? Can it be that this is when he forewarns that group and then he takes the pre-trib group and then bang, the 50 days begin. There's the seven for the wedding and the Lord comes back on the eighth day. Well, that's his birthday. 
if that's his birthday, which was in Taurus, and it was the beginning of creation, you see what I'm saying? If you look at it that way, this would be in the beginning, and this would be when he comes back at his birthday as light. Unfortunately, what we find out, or unfortunately because it pushes it two months, is that we find out that the word beginning is the word for the Feast of First Fruits, which takes place on the 16th day of the first month, which you would think would be back at Nisan, but in the beginning, it was Taurus. You guys all know this. It was Taurus. Hence again, with the two months, it brings us to this period, and this being two months after his birth, and the time when he comes as light. But my main point in this is the time when he's coming as light. He's coming to give his light to the remnant workers and to shine it on everybody that, that's around, everybody that will listen. It's the time of his light. He's coming to shine his light in the darkness. We all know that Christ is the true light. Do you look at this word for light, guys. This word for light, which is the one for Christ, see right here, is only found in Luke 21, 36, and in John 1, 9 in the Gospels. You can follow it, and it's all about Christ or the light that Christ gave to others. Okay? So let's have a look at this. Well, John, John chapter 1, verse 9 is pretty straightforward. We've all already understood the beginning now. We now see when he's light. So what is he? Verse 9. That was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Okay? We know Jesus is the light. So he was the beginning. He was then the light. And in the prophetic typology, you could see it's from the beginning, right before the start of the 50 days. Seven days for the wedding, like that Leia wedding, and then the start of his 40 days. Now, let's go see what it says in Luke. Check this out. Let's go to Luke. Let's go over, over in uh, Esword. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, check this out. We've talked on this in the past. This is a great one. We know that the difference within the signs of Jonah are prophetically speaking to the end of days. Jesus did not fulfill the 40 days as prophet Jonah. He, that, that's why in Mark, you see the sign of Jonah. He gave no sign and he left. And when you go to Matthew, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, he never fulfilled that yet. That hasn't been complete. Which means when people discuss and debate these and say, ah, you see this contradiction is so man-made written that they didn't even come close to getting this right. Nope, it's all prophecy. And so what is this the picture of? You guessed it. The son of man coming after the eight-day wedding to start his 40 days where he's going to be, as Jonah was, warning the people. That's what Luke's uh, a good portion of Luke's discourse is about. When you see Jerusalem compass about, flee to the mountains. That's Jesus' warning during his 40 days while he's there with that remnant worker group bride. Okay? So here's that Jonah part. And there's a reason that the Gospels are written and certain stories aren't the same one after the other. You know, you would think it would be the same story after Luke and Mark and Matthew. After each story, the same story. After each story, the same story. But they aren't. In fact, in Luke's, what follows this conversation of Jesus being like Jonah for 40 days is the story about the light in you. And you only find it in Luke. Seven different ways, I believe it was. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways for the word light to be used or times that it's used. And I think six different writings, meanings of it. Look at this. 3088, 5338, 5460. Crazy, right? 
54-57. Ah, look at this one. 54-61. Do you know what this one is? Christ. Christ. Do you think do you think it, it it's by chance that it only comes at the point where he's talking about being like um Jonah for 40 days and he's talking about being the light. And when he's when when the light is in you, when the light is in you, what is he going to go hide you uh under a bed or under a bushel and do all that stuff? Or is he going to put it on a stand? Who's he giving the light to, guys? Yes, yeah, sure, everybody that will come to him. But he's giving it to that group who is being girded about and their lights burning. This is the group that he's opened their understanding to. You see? Listen to this. Uh, let's read all of uh, Luke 11, verse 36. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth Give the light. Who's the bright shining one in the midst of the candles? Christ. Who's the one coming as light to give his light at the time that he represents light? Christ. And when he does, who's the group that he's going to first that were prepared, ready, and waiting for him? The ones that were girded about and their lights burning. All of it, all of this time, and all of this period that's coming is about him giving his light and anointing this group to go out and shed uh, and spread and share that light. Got to remember, guys, for those that don't know, it's all connected to the creation stories. This is that first creation group right here that was spirit. Jesus was the beginning. And then Jesus was made light which is exactly what John said in chapter one, which is exactly why it's where it is in John eight, which is exactly why it is where it is in Luke 11, which is exactly where it is and how it describes it in Isaiah chapter nine. All, every single part of those, every single one of them connected to the beginning of his 40 days in the prophetic picture of the end. The beginning of his 40 days and the start of day one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seventh day. And for those that might be newer that hadn't heard this yet, let me share this zinger with you. Second uh, Peter chapter three, verse eight. One of my favorites. I have so many favorites. I might say that a lot, but there's so many favorites. This one is beautiful. It reveals that the truth is 14 years. That of the end of days. It reveals it by showing you that to God, it's seven days and seven days. That to man, it's 7,000 and 7,000. But what was missing? Verse one and two. They were a separate portion. That's right. They're the spirit and bride portion, you see? The spirit and bride say come. They're their own portion. So, so look at, listen to Second Peter 3.8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day, one day, is with the Lord. So if you are with the Lord in his presence in heaven, one day is like a thousand years. Yikes. <laughs> That's a long day. Comma and. Why comma and is important? Why is it important? Because it means they are separate but added together. Which means it's not just one saying it one way and one just repeating it for emphasis the other way. They are two separate reasons being added together. They're back to back. So what does it say next? And a thousand years is as one day. Most people just thought it was just reiterating it to really bring it home. That's not what it's saying. In the days of creation from Genesis 1 verse 3 or 4. To the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, it's the days of creation. So each day is with the Lord because it was there with the Lord. Each day, and there were seven days, which means they were like a 7,000 years. Each day was a 1,000 years, 
but it was the Lord there. So each day was it was like a day. Because with them, it, it seems like a day. But if we were there in the in the dimension of time, each one of those days would have been a thousand years. Comma and. A thousand years is as a day. Now, what does that mean? Well, from when the flesh was created from Adam, we've been in the thousands of years. You see, because now we're in the dimension of time where we have thousands of years and each thousand to the Lord is as one day, which means the days of creation, which are seven in the perception of time, each one of those would have been a thousand years. So 7,000 years, seven days to the Lord. We're now in the dimension of time. Each one is a thousand years that we're living in, which to the Lord, each one is only as a day. And what do we have in these thousands of years? 6,000. And when the 6,000 are over, which is the end of the 14 years, the millennial reign begins, which is the 7,000th year. So what do you have? 7,000, it would have been like for us in time. 7,000, it is for us in time. To the Lord, because he was there in the creation of days, it was a day to him, so it was seven days. And it means the 7,000 that we've been in and that we are in coming closer to an end of six, it's seven days total for the Lord. So what was it? Seven days to the Lord, seven days to the Lord. We're in 7,000 years for us. 7,000 years is what the days would have been like for us. What's the end of years? The end of days? Seven years, seven years. Days, years, thousands. Seven and seven. Craziness, right? We've got a video. If you ever really want to go deeper into that, there's a video on the intro page. Once you really come to understand a lot of these things, go to the very last video on the intro page, but don't skip the rest of them getting there. And you'll come to see the revelation of creation because you see, there's that portion of verse one and verse two of Genesis. And even though they're only a, a, a prophetic small period of time in the big story, they were also a seven. Just like Jacob being so excited, he worked for his wife. They felt they were seven years, but they felt like days. It's the same prophetic picture. It's beautiful. It's absolutely incredible. So what we're seeing in all this is light, light, light. It's all connected to Christ being light. Now, remember, I told you guys that we're going to get into this in relation to the enemy. This enemy that's trying to trip us up and, and draw us away and pull us away. I want you to understand, we know things begin as light. And we know it will end as light. What do you think comes in between? Well, there'll be the workers of light, right? Do you know there's another light? Do you know that there's another powerful light coming in the midst of seals and in the midst of trumpets? It's a really interesting one. We, we touched on this, but I've never done it in relation to sharing the enemies before in the way I'm going to do it this time. We know who they are. We know that there's three. And just like, you know, it's very interesting when you go look into it. We're going to touch on this in a moment. But when it comes to the false prophet, we understand the false prophet. We know his periods of time. We know when he's finally killed. We know when he shows up on the scene with the beast. But you know what? With the false prophet, he's he's very much... um uh, um. Like the Holy Ghost, obviously the bad compared to the good. But you know when people have gone to heaven, we've shared a number of videos that I believe were truth in having these visitations and death going to heaven. And the evidence, I always believe, is in how their life turned around, like full 180, living for the Lord for the next 20, 30, 40 years and doing ministries and discipleships and all sorts of things from having come from places of murder and 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 uh just not believing and dope smokers and everything else so the reason i bring it up is because in all of these things when people have gone to to the third heaven they've seen the father sitting on the throne they never see his face 
Usually they could see his hair and maybe like his the ends of his feet or his hands. That's generally what you get in the description. And I've I've heard a number of them over the years. And when it comes to Jesus, they always describe him. They could see his face. His hair was shoulder length. You know, he was maybe X amount tall or whatever, but he had the shoulder length hair brown. He had he had like either greenish rich eyes and he had like a, a Middle Eastern complexion. Right. Right. Like a, like the Jews, you know, in that area. So he's got that complexion because they know what he looks like. Do you know who's never described? Of course, the Holy Ghost. You never get a description from anybody seeing the Holy Ghost. I've never heard of it. Not once. And I haven't listened to a ton, but the ones I've heard, I've never heard anybody seeing the, the spirit there in heaven somehow. Never once. But every time there's the father and there's the son. It's pretty interesting. And the reason I mention it is because this similarity, kind of similar, but not really, but kind of similar in what happens uh, with the enemy. Now, the false prophet will be a person, will be an indwelt person. But when when you when you go into it, there's he's he's much more mysterious than the other ones. The Antichrist and Satan, or the Lucifer and Satan, they're not overly difficult. We don't necessarily for sure know the, the person that they will indwell. But you can have a better understanding than you can of the false prophet. It's very interesting. And we'll kind of see this as we go through. Just You can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But you'll understand why I'm talking and why I went into light and so forth. So we recently discovered this as we had been going into things with uh, Daniel chapter 8 and, and finally revealed Revelation 7 to Daniel 8 and that the horns of 8 are not clearly not the same horns as Daniel 7, that the horns of Daniel 8 are the mountains. And they are the mountains which are the description of the horns from Revelation 17 and, of course, uh, where the description of it is in Revelation 13. And when we broke this down, and we've understood this, and we'll cover some of those points again, there was something very interesting that came up. And that was in Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. A beast rise up out of the sea. Okay? We know it's the, it's the beast, it's the Antichrist. And then... When we came down here in Revelation 13, 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And for the longest time, you know, people have read this and you think, well, OK, so he's coming out of the sea of humanity and he's coming out of the earth of somebody on earth, similar to the sea of humanity, just another person. But there's more to it. These beings were also created beings, right? Look at what we see, what we had started to find out. We've covered so much in this in the last couple of three months, but only touched on this before. So we've got the beast coming out of the sea, who is the beast of, of Revelation, and we've got the beast coming out of the earth, who is the false prophet. And let me help you guys just to be certain that this is the false prophet who is the beast coming out of the earth, we see that he has power to do signs and miracles in the sight of the beast and so forth, right? So if we go to Revelation chapter 19, just so that you guys can understand that it's that it's true, is we see in Revelation 19, 20, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him, you see? Which with which he had deceived, uh, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. These both were cast into the lake of fire with brimstone. Say, so clearly, the false prophet is the beast that comes out of the earth. Okay, just so everybody can see that and understand it. So who is this beast coming out of the sea and coming out of the earth? How can we understand 
even though we've been able to prove it many times, how do we know that this time frame is connected to seals? Well, it helps when we know who the beast was or the timing of this beast or these two beasts out of the sea and out of the earth. So many of you guys will know, we've covered this over the years. This is from uh, Second Baruch, one of the Apocrypha books. And again, for anybody that's new, we don't go to the Apocryphas and take things from there and try to go prove it out in Scripture. That is never, ever, ever how it's happened here in this ministry. It is the revelation of Scripture that when going into Apocryphas later or somebody going into searching these things out, comes across them after the revelation has been revealed in Scripture. And then we find even more things to back it up, okay? And this was one of those things. I mean, it was awesome. You know, greater than these two tribulations. <laughs> there are two tribulations. Why? Because it's seven and seven. One of seals, one of trumpets, one for Mark, one for Matthew, two tribulations. We see all the description. You know, we've talked about this before here. It says right here, those who live on the earth in those days will not understand that this is the end of times. But at that time, whoever understands will be wise for the measure and the calculation of that time is two parts a week of seven weeks. Two parts a week of seven weeks. Well, what on earth is that talking about? See, two parts, one, two of what? Of seven weeks. Because the total is what? 49. There was seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years. 49. And then what do you get? The final Jubilee. But the end of days is two portions of seven years. The final two of the 49. Pretty crazy, right? So, and then that's why you see these two tribulations. The only way you can really, I mean, I don't know how people explain this before. They were just dividing it in like three and a half years and three and a half years, I guess. But once you understand the revelation of the gospels in the 14 years, it's, it's bananas awesome. It's so crazy awesome to understand it. It blows you away. Now listen to this. This is chapter, what, it, chapter 29, I guess? Or chapter, I'm not sure which chapter. Yeah, I guess it's chapter 29. Uh, verse 4 of 2nd Baruch. And Bohemoth will be revealed from its place, and Leviathan will arise from the sea. Those two great monsters, which I created on the fifth day of creation, and which I have kept until this time. What? Bohemoth and Leviathan, one out of the sea and one out of the earth. One out of the sea and one out of the earth. One is the beast, Antichrist, and the other is the false prophet. So how do we know that this is connected, that these guys are playing their part in their portion of seals. Well, I was just able to explain to you that the portion of seals is the prophetic picture in the typology of the days of creation. And he said he created them in the days of creation, right? Connected to the fifth day of creation. So connected to the fifth day of creation, which is a time frame within the midst of seals, of the seven years of seals to the typology of the seven days of creation. Which means that in Revelation chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet are actually Leviathan and Bohemoth, which were reserved for this time of the end. I don't even know what that means, guys. I know that it means they're going to be here at this time in the midst of seals. That that part, we, we, we get it. We understand it. But we also know that they're going to be people. That's because they're going to be indwelt by these spirits at that time. That's what it means. I don't know. I don't believe there's going to be, you know, uh, Godzilla's going around on the earth, you know, one in the sea and, and uh, one from the earth. 
no, I don't believe that's going to happen. We're talking about seals. There, there's still going to be another 10 and a half years of tribulation to go. Could you imagine? <laughs> it would be crazy. And they're not going to be ruling nations as leaders. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But the spirit of these beings are being held till that time. One is Leviathan and one is Bohemian. Let me show you something. You ready to keep getting your mind blown to, to understand and seeing this get pieced together? Well, it gets better. Because remember, everything I'm talking about now is to share with you guys the understanding of light. It's all about light. Okay? Jesus is the true light. But have you ever asked yourself, one second. Have you ever asked yourself that when we go to Daniel chapter 7, watch this. In Daniel chapter 7, we've got the four beasts, right? The first beast is a lion. The second one is a bear. The second one, the third one is a leopard. So these are all beasts, okay? They're not horns. They're not anything. They are their own beasts. We know each one has its portion over the first 50 days and or actually really over the first about two and a half years of the tribulation of seals. Until the fourth beast gets his power. And when he gets that power and authority, who is this fourth beast? Well, you guessed it. This fourth beast is the beast from Revelation 13. He is the Antichrist. He is the, the seventh of the eighth mountain, right? Or the, the eighth of the seventh mountain. And what do we see? Well, during World War III, that begins with Assad attacking Jerusalem and destroying it so that all the Jews flee, which is what Jesus, as the light when he came for 40 days, is warning about as Jonah that we're reading about in Luke chapter one, uh, Luke chapter 21's discourse. He's warning of this attack coming by Syria when they'll be compassed about and then destroyed and they will all flee to the mountains or be captured or be killed. Then the destroyer of the Gentiles, the bear, is coming. World War III will officially begin at Syria destroying Jerusalem. But when it really goes to the whole world, it will be when it breaks out with the bear and, and it hits nations everywhere. And that probably, I don't think it would be too much later. But short, you know, weeks or months later at most. And then what do we have? Then we have the leopard. Remember, the leopard is connected to Germany and in that area. And what do we have? We've got the World Economic Forum, right? Through Klaus Schwab. I mean, that guy's like the, the perfect evil villain. I mean, he even looks like it. I mean, it's unbelievable. But it, it's almost too obvious. <laughs> it's crazy obvious, right? But... I believe that those guys are the ones connected to the leopard. Now, you have to ask yourself something. The fourth beast, who is the Antichrist of Revelation chapter 13. Listen to this. In Revelation 13, we know that when the fourth beast comes and he gets that power, we know that he now has control of the leopard, of the bear, and of the lion. What would cause these nations or groups of nations with the leopard? You see, the bear is the army, is the military or the feet. The lion is, is the head, right? The mouth, the head. But the leopard is the control center. And why does that matter? Because it is absolutely what the World Economic Forum has been preparing, right? They're the ones that have been preparing all of this. They're the ones. So when we think of the elites and those behind the curtain, you know, there are others behind the World Economic Forum, right, that are deep behind the curtain. But when you see who goes to the World Economic Forum, all of the who's who of big business, uh, especially uh, uh, tech and the gates and, and government, I mean, when you see who's there, it's, it's absurd. And Klaus Schwab is the leader, right? What on earth would cause Arabs, like the lion, Russians, and especially 
German and, and some of those in that section in Europe to give their power to the Antichrist? Is it simply because he's going to be so powerful? Well, the only way he's going to be powerful is when he has the power of the bear. How, how are the how is the the Arabs? What will cause them to turn to him? Well, that's the easy part, right? He's going to be their Mahdi. That that is their Mahdi coming, right? The Antichrist is the Mahdi. So of course it won't be difficult. All the Arabs will go for him. But why will the World Economic Forum? Why will the leopard in, in that connection of groups? Do you remember who they worship, guys? Why would they give their power? Just because he's so rich and powerful? Because he speaks flattering words? That's it? Or is it because they worship Lucifer? Hello. Do you guys remember how I've told you that Lucifer is to seals and then he's killed and then he's brought back right when the pit is open and Satan has been cast down and Lucifer comes back. So you, who's Lucifer, guys? He's the Antichrist. He'll be the indwelled spirit of the Antichrist. Not maybe. He's Lucifer. Remember where the beast comes from? The beast is coming from the sea. The false prophet is coming from the earth. These guys worship Lucifer. So they would be more than honored to give their allegiance to their light. Hello. You're not sure that that's true? You're still uncertain about it? Watch this. We've shared the difference between um, the cherubim and seraphim. Let me show you this real quick. The seraphim, let me show you the seraphim. You see the brightness from his brightness. We all know Lucifer was the angel of light, right? And what was he? He was a cherub. He was the anointed cherub, okay? The cherub. They are the ones around the throne of Christ, around Jesus' seat. That is where the cherub are. Do you remember where the seraphim are? Check this out. The seraphim, listen to this, in Isaiah 6.1, in the year king, as I saw also the Lord sitting upon, so the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Above it stood the seraphim. You see, there's it's the confusion that people have believing that Lucifer is Satan. It all goes back to things I've taught on many times and what I was talking about in the intro videos. When you get to, um, uh, which video is it? It's all because of Matthew. When you get to that video and you really take the time to dissect it, you'll realize how important that video is, how revealing that video is. Because we've all been taught through the perspective of Matthew's eyes, we only through, see through the seven years of Matthew's perspective. So everybody believes in a seven-year tribulation. Everybody thinks that the, the world is only 7,000 years old. When the truth is, it'll be 21,000 complete at the end of the millennial reign, and the 22nd thousand will be the beginning of the new heaven and the new earth. It's wild once you understand it. But that's why it's blinded us to so many things. And from that has caused division after division after division after division. To now where we've got 40,000 denominations. These revelations would have cut those by thousands. Because when you see something that looks pre and you think it's mid or or you think it's pre, but really it's mid, you end up calling it pre even though it's mid because you don't understand there's something that comes before. So anything that even seems to mention uh, a taking, everybody in a pre says, see, pre, pre, pre. Oh, those are all pre when they're not. Most of the things they're pointing to are actually mid. And when they go to Matthew's discourse, it's even worse. 
Because the Lord says immediately after the tribulation of those days is when the Lord's coming. And they think that that's the, the pre-trib. Not even close. Matthew's discourse is, is seven years of trumpets and the post-trib return of the Lord's feet down. At the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the 13th year of tribulation when he will deal with them in that final 14th year. Which is the year as it was in the days of Noah. Once you understand these differences in the Gospels and the 14 years and the portion above, man, does everything open up. It's a blessing beyond anything that could be explained until you go and search it out for yourself. It's incredible. So it's the same thing that happened with Lucifer and Satan. They would say he's the same being. But as you guys know, we can go to Revelation 16 and see that I saw uh, 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 spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Hello. There's three of them right there. I was just able to show you that the one out of the sea and the one out of the earth are the ones that were created in the days of creation. And one is one is uh, uh, Leviathan, the other one's Bohemus. And Leviathan is the one that's the beast who is the Antichrist. And he comes out of the sea. So if I just showed you that now we can go to cherub and it was the one around Christ's throne and he was the fallen cherub. And we know around God's throne, there were the ser there are the seraphim and there's a fallen one from the seraphim. Then do you think the seraphim would mean Satan? Hello. A poisonous serpent, a fiery serpent. That's Satan. So when we go back to Ezekiel 28, who do you think the cherub is? Well, we know it's Lucifer, right? Are you what you want me to show you? The connection to the timing of this being Lucifer? Ezekiel 28, verse 2. Son of man, say to the prince of Tarus, uh, of Tarus, Tyrus, <laughs> thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God. Okay? I want you to remember that because this isn't Satan. This is Lucifer. Okay. And, 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 and I have said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. Where? In the midst of the sea. In the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Hello. Did you hear that? He's wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hid from him. You realize we know it's the Laodicean age. The whole world knows it's the Laodicean age in the church. You don't think Lucifer's aware and he's trying to do everything to stop you? With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, Thou hast gotten the riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. What did he say in Laodicea? I'm fine. We're good. We've got gold and riches and abundance. Right? To the lukewarm. Who do you think's fooled them with it with riches? Lucifer? Who do we know from, you know, sometimes in interviews, <laughs> right? Sometimes from people doing digs and studies that a lot of these people of great riches, who do they worship? Lucifer. A lot of people know that with the Masons, with their very high up, knowingly and aware, they worship Lucifer. Who is he? He's the one from the sea. Hello. He's the one from the sea. Verse 6. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers, <laughs> excuse me, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness, right? Because he's the fallen light, right? Another picture we say is like, is like the sun. And the moon is the false prophet. 
because they've gone out of place, right? The the sun is two months off now from where it was in the beginning at, in Taurus. We have uh, uh, the moon that's off by, by 10, 11 days every year. Calendars have to be adjusted. And then you've got the planets out there, which are a picture of the fallen angels that are in outer darkness. Now, you can also, again, this is typology. So the sun, sometimes we know, is a prophetic picture in a typology of Christ. Not Christ, but in a typology. But when you go back to ancient Egypt, you have them worshiping the bull and, and the sun god. You see? They, they, there's this combination and confusion all throughout history, and some of them fully aware also of which light they're going after or that they're following. So what does it say? And they shall draw the swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Listen to this. They shall bring thee to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Who is he? The one from the sea? Claiming to be ruler in his throne in the seas? But he's going to be defeated with strangers, and he's going to be what? Sent down to the pit. Sent down to the pit. But for that to be right, he had to be in the days of creation. Check. He had to be from the sea. Check. And we know that Lucifer, this beast indwelled by Lucifer, is going to lose in a battle and is going to be cast into the pit. Check. Did you notice it said pit? It wasn't like a fire. Do you know why? Of course you do. You guys have been following long enough, right? Here he is right here. Then the Ancient of Days comes. This is when they're coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words, which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame concerning the rest of the beasts. You see? The rest of the beasts. Who are the rest of the beasts? The other three. They had their dominion taken away and their lives prolonged for a season and time. So the beast is slain. Which means here he was with power and authority. And from Revelation 13, he had that power and authority that told us it was for 42 months. So from about two and a half years into seals after World War III is settling down because he steps forward, he now has the power of all those other three that give their authority to him. And who is he? He's the indwelt Lucifer from the sea. I mean, you might say, well, he didn't proclaim himself to be God on the throne yet. No, but he did by the mark of the beast, you see. He did by the mark of the beast because during the time of seals, it's still the time like Moses. It's the it's the portable temple covered in flesh, which everybody is. During our Gentile age that will come to an end at the end of seals, we are the walking temple of God. So we are a portable flesh-covered temple, you see? And that's what he's going to defile. And we see that he's claiming it from the seas. And he's the beast from the sea. But it said his power in Revelation 13 is only going to be 42 months. All right? This is where he gets power to continue 42 months. That's because he was here earlier. But this is when he gets his power now. This is when his authority to take over is going to happen during these 42 months, during this time of seals. This is when all of these others give their allegiance to him. And who is he? He's the light. The lesser light of course the false light the deceiver light and what happens <clears throat> we go to revelation 17 and we know exactly who he is we know this play out you see it didn't say he was cast into the lake of fire in ezekiel 28 it said that he was put into the pit why 
because the beast that thou sawest was, that's the 42 months, is not, because as we saw in Daniel 7, as you guys all know, Daniel 7, he's killed. When he's killed, where is he put? Well, we just read that Lucifer, the false light, who is from the sea, who is Leviathan, who is the beast of Revelation 13, who had that power then for 42 months and had control over them because they gave their authority to their Lucifer light and the others because it was their Mahdi. He was killed at the end of seals. We just saw that in Daniel 7. So he is not during the first half of trumpets. And then what does it say? And shall ascend out of the lake of fire? No. Shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Where was he sent in Ezekiel 38, 28? When he was killed, he was sent to the pit. Daniel 7, he was killed. Where do you think he ends up going? He goes to the pit. That's what's going on. It is Lucifer who is the Antichrist. He is the indwelt spirit. That's who he is, guys. He is the indwelt spirit, which is, as we've shared, <clears throat> connected to this abomination of desolation, which is Mark's discourse. Standing or to place is another word for it, where it ought not. It's the mark of the beast in the fleshly temple that's portable during the time of seals. This is when he gets his power to continue, and here he is right here. Now false Christs and false prophets show up. And when does he get killed? Mark 13, 24. But in those days, you see that? After that tribulation. After that tribulation, you go to Matthews and it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Why? Because there are two tribulations. Hello. You see, the apocryphos know what they're saying. You have to be careful with them. You don't use them to interpret scripture. You get the scripture and then you go, you can go find things that are connected that reveal more understanding in the apocryphos. The sun shall be dark and the moon shall fall. Okay. This is when he's killed. When the Lord's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Now we go to Genesis chapter three. Because seals is the portion of Lucifer's indwelled spirit of the beast. You now can see it with your own eyes. You have seen it. He is the one connected from the sea. And the false prophet is the one connected from the earth. We know it and we know when their time is fully over as well. But you see, when he's killed at the end of seals and is not during trumpets, it tells us he's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. How is he going to ascend out of the bottomless pit? We've all read it. We've studied it. But let's go see what Genesis chapter 3 now tells us. You see? So you've got the first creation of spirit, which was the beginning, verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. Then you got the seven days of creation, which were like 7,000 years, which in the end are a picture of seven, day, uh, seven years of, of seals. And you've got the two beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet. At the end of it, before the seventh day of rest or the seventh year of rest or that 7,000th year of rest, bang, he's killed. And then when the seventh year of seals and now trumpets begin, and and the and the beast is not. We now go, the Gentile age is over, and it goes back to what it was like in the beginning. Well, what beginning? The Jews' beginning, brothers and sisters. The Jews' beginning. The the people the 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 people whose age we're living in. The Jews are his chosen people, and we're living in their fleshly portion of his of their time. There are those with the spirit, the light, living in flesh. There are those with the light, living in flesh. And there are those living in flesh. The light, spirit-filled, living in flesh are about to go. That's the pre-trip. A group of spirit will remain, be given greater light, and will also be given greater spirit at the 50 days. 
and they will go out and give the light and fill the light for those during the time of light, which is the creation of days, while the Antichrist and the false prophet are there. But now when it goes back to when it goes back to flesh, what do we have here? We have the garden, right? We have Re uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent that we may eat of the trees of the garden. Wasn't well, that interesting? Why eat of the trees of the garden? Well, you guys know this. You see, the first group is going to the third heaven. When the pre-trib group is taken, they're going to the third heaven in that beginning of the 50 days, which is the above 14 years. And then you have was caught up into paradise in the prophetic picture of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This group going to paradise is going to where the Lord had prepared a place. Again, something you guys all understand. If we go to the chapters to years, now we get to John chapter 14, and where is it? It's exactly lined up with the time of the great multitude rapture where Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you in my father's house. And when I return, I will receive you unto myself that there I am, there you may be also. When is that? 100% at the great multitude rapture. Where is their place prepared? Paradise. What is another name for paradise? The garden. The garden. So now the garden is here, right? Heavenly Mount Zion. I have no idea what that's going to look like. In the clouds above Jerusalem, I have no idea what it'll look like. But we know that it's coming at the end of seals. And it'll be here during the time of trumpets. In particular, during that first half. And who comes to deceive the flesh? Huh. Lucifer? No. That doesn't say Lucifer. What does it say? What does it call the serpent? Let me see. Let me highlight it. Why? What does it say the serpent is? Well, remember what seraphim were described as? Huh. A serpent. A serpent, like a snake from his hissing. The serpent. What was the seraphim? You got it. A serpent, a flying serpent. That was Satan. Satan is not Lucifer. But they're like, they're almost like a father and son. They're not father and son, I get it. But they're, they're playing out a, a typology as the father and son, the true father and son, the Lord God Father and Jesus God the Son. That's what they're playing out. You see? So now who's going to try to corrupt in the time when the garden is here, when heavenly Mount Zion has come down and the great multitude rapture is taken up? They're there during the first half of, of trumpets. Everything's going to seem fine, with the exception of, yes, these things happening around the world during the first half of trumpets. You're going to have all these devastating things from the first four trumpet blasts, right? And then what happens? Well, in Revelation um, chapter 17, we saw that the beast was, and then he was killed at the end of seals, like Daniel said, and he was put into the pit, as Ezekiel said. And so now he's not during the first half of trumpets, but what has come down? Heavenly Mount Zion, which is paradise, where the rapture group is going to be taken. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Who's coming out of the bottomless pit? Satan? No. Lucifer. Lucifer, the indwelt spirit of Lucifer. That guy's coming back from the pit. He's the one from the bottomless pit that goes into Perdition. What do we know about him? Well, look at what it says in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, 
we see that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Um, and verse nine, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Okay. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And now the heaven and everybody's rejoicing, but woe to the earth because he knows that he has a short time, right? Woe to the earth, to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. And so we see here, it's the dragon Satan that's going to go after the woman. We know the woman now is going to fly away on the wings of a great eagle into the wilderness. This is now mid-trumpets, ten and a half years, approximately into tribulation. And they're now going to be taken to a place to be safe till the very end of the 14 years. And they will come back for the final jubilee when they'll be given their divisions of land. Who's going after them? The dragon. Well, where's Lucifer? I thought Lucifer had to come back. Isn't the dragon then? The one coming out of the pit? No. You just saw he was cast down to the earth. How's he coming out of the pit if he's being cast down to the earth? Well, to answer that, is it 11 or 9? I think it's 9. We come to 9, verse 1, Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and great smoke and fire of a furnace, uh, smoke of a great furnace, and by reason of the sun and darkness. Okay. Now the pit is opened. Who do we know is coming out of the pit? Well, we know the beast, right? We know Lucifer's coming back. So what do we see? Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's start in, oh, check this out. Let's start in verse two. No. Yeah, let's start in verse two. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay? Now, this is taking us back to the great falling away, the time of the apostasy. You see, we know here in this ministry, and everybody knows that the apostasy age is Laodicea. We all know it. But because people haven't understood the is to come of the seven churches, there were great teachers like, um, like, uh, 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 um, shoot, what's his name? Oh, come on. There's no way I should forget his name. I knew it, and then I thought about it, and I forgot it. Um, he just passed not too long ago. Chuck Missler. So there were there's some great teachers like Chuck Missler who knew that there was going to be a revelation that would come for the understanding of the seven churches in relation to their play in the end of days. He was wise enough to understand that it wasn't yet known. But most people don't realize that it's going to play out again. And so what happens is saying that we're in the Laodicean age, they believe that this is the falling away happening and the son of perdition is coming which means they believe that this will play out as the final seven years are the end of the Laodicean age. You see that? They believe that the end of days, this their, their seven years of tribulation, will be seven years, and it'll be the last seven years of Laodicea. Because they have no understanding that they're going to play out again in a typology, instead of thousands of years, they'll play out over 50 days and the 14 years. So everybody thinks that the great falling away is now coming. And here's the thing. It's because we are in the Laodicean age. 
It is a time of falling away. This is why I say anybody's saying the greatest revival is coming. It's coming. Well, that w- uh, we all hope it's coming. And it is coming. But it's not coming until the tribulation begins. There is no great revival, especially the greatest in all of human history, in the midst of the age called apostasy and falling away. Absolutely zero chance. But the great news is it will start again. And when it starts, it's right off the bat. It'll be the new apostolic age and the beginning of the greatest revival in history. So this is why you see, just if you follow their train of thought, you'll see how absolutely confusing this is to understand. How can we be in the Laodicean age, expect a great falling away, and the greatest revival in history? When the pit is then about to be opened, and the son of perdition will come midway through? It's impossible. You're you're, you're trying to stick a a circle in a triangle. It's it's not going to happen. And that's the confusion that we get, always having been taught from one perspective of Matthew. So we get Matthew's perspective, but we read everything else. But because we unknowingly have a foundation in Matthew, everything butts up against it and we try to make it fit. And we can't. Okay, so this falling away, yes, we are in a Laodicean age. Yes, it is a time of apostasy and falling away. And yes, we must guard ourselves more than ever with every passing day coming this year. But the apostasy and the falling away being spoken of in Second uh, Thessalonians is not the one we're in now. It is the one when the son of perdition comes. That is the final age. And when does it begin? At mid-trumpets. At about three and a half years into trumpets. The period of Israel's kings, the removal time comes. This is when Messiah is cut off, right? He was there, Mount Zion. They were there for the last year of seals, the first about three and a half years of trumpets. The 144,000, Philadelphia, are going out in missionary stuff during that time with Yeshua Jesus as the Joshua, uh, um, uh, uh, son of Joseph, the Joshua high priest, the the Melchizedek high priest and king, with the modern day Zerubbabel, who's anointed there with them, as the other anointed Messiah, not the Messiah, but an anointed Messiah, who's going to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple from this time to mid-seals at the cutoff, I mean mid-trumpets at the cutoff. Why is there a cutoff? Because Satan's been cast down. The pit is open. And it's the final tribulation age, the final end of the age of the final falling away time of apostasy when the son of perdition comes back. Now, what do we know about the son of perdition? Light. Hello. He's the false light. He's the false light coming again. Is it Satan that's going to go into the temple? Now, remember, during the first half of trumpets, the actual city and the street, the wall and the temple was rebuilt. You see, when the seals time is over, the the fleshly Moses temple, portable temple covered in skins that was in the wilderness is gone. That time is over. It goes back to the time of the Jews now. And when trumpets begins... (laughs) <laughs> when the seven years of trumpets begins, it begins with the rebuilding of the city, the streets, and the temple. That's why Matthew's discourse is different with the abomination of desolation. When the son of perdition comes back, when the pit is opened, as we saw, and he comes back and he is the son of perdition, he's the one going in the temple. You know what's this is why I was saying these things are copies. Satan is taking and trying to be the power as the father is. And he's going to give his authority to Lucifer, quote unquote, his son. You see, and Lucifer is trying to take authority from Christ. That's why he's the antichrist. He is the one against Christ. He is the ultimate one 
against Christ, whereas Satan is the ultimate one against the Father. And so he's mimicking everything on the deceptive, lying, cheating, false side of everything. And so the Father, in the end, is he going to be the one sitting on the throne? Or is Christ? Christ is. Christ is going to be the one sitting on his throne. So would Lucifer, I mean, would Satan be the one going to sit on the throne and go to be the one declaring himself God sitting on the throne? Or would he give that to his quote unquote son, Lucifer? He's giving it to Lucifer. He's copying everything on a deceptive side as father God and son God, Jesus God. Listen to this. You can see this will go right to the end of that time of trumpets. Watch this. To the end of the 13th year of tribulation or that final th uh, sixth year of trumpets when the Lord returns. This time as lightning from one end unto the other. See, it starts at the light and it will end with the greatest light of all. Who opposeth, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Who opposeth and exalts himself above all that is called God. Well, who's doing it? The son of perdition. Son of perdition isn't Satan, it's Lucifer. That is called God and that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withhold it that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only who, he who lets will let until he be taken out of the way. See? Until the Lord's taken out of the way. Until the time of Messiah being cut off. And the war breaks out for those two and a half years. And the final two and a half of the final three and a half years of trumpets. Now listen to what it says here. And then shall that wicked. Okay? The, the son of perdition, Lucifer. Be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Coming. Which coming is this? You guys all know this. Those of you who have been around for a while, you know this one very well in this ministry. One, two, three, four times it's used in the Gospels. And all four of them are found in Matthew 24. If you're newer, now you begin to understand that Luke's is the above portion, that Mark's is during seals, and that Matthew's is during trumpets. What do you think the coming of the Lord will be at the to the end of the world? Why do you think it's in Matthew 24, not in Luke and not in Mark? Because it's about the coming of the Son of Man. You guessed it. It's about his return feet down. It's so clear. Let me show you. See, it said at the brightness of his coming. Watch this. I think verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hello. And we know this isn't at the end of 14 years. At the end of this, it's not the end of the seventh year of trumpets. It's at the end of the 13 years of tribulation or the sixth year of trumpets. Because Satan with Lucifer and the false prophet, they only got two and a half years to wreak their havoc and to claim what they wanted to claim before the Lord came feet down as lightning from one end to the other to fulfill the final year when it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. Look at this. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming, there it is, of the Son of Man be. Why? Because there is one more year where he destroys all the enemies once and for all in the great wine press of the wrath of Almighty God, which is the 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 year of his the, the what is it the the day uh, the day of his wrath and the year of his vengeance, which is the year of his vengeance, right? So, oh, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. Okay, we get that from Isaiah and from other places. So now, watch this. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians. So at his coming. When he comes as light in his day from one from uh, one end unto the other. We also know this from Luke 17, 25. But if we go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
What did it say? He's going to destroy the wicked, right? Consume him with the mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we know this is when he's coming at the final 14th year of tribulation, at the beginning to fulfill that final year. And he's going to kill the wicked one who is the son of perdition who came back from the pit, which was from mid-trumpets for which they had two and a half years to do their thing. But was that it? Well, no, that would mean he only kills the Antichrist. What about the false prophet? Well, if you remember at the end of seals, and we've showed this many times within the discourses, at the end of seals, uh, the sixth year of seals, we know Antichrist is killed. But the rest of them weren't killed. We know that includes the false prophet that wasn't killed. You see this character that we really don't know who he is. But he's going to do some things, but he doesn't have to pay the price initially. Only the, only the beast will. And so when we've gone to the discourses, we've shown that incredible uh, uh, piece of understanding. When you go to Luke's discourse, it says nothing about false Christs or false prophets. Because it's all about that above short period, above 14 years. When we go to Mark's discourse, we see... In the first half of Mark's discourse, it's essentially the, the whole World War III and, and things starting to go against each other. And then the Mark of the Beast, because who shows up? Well, then you get false Christs and false prophets in the second half of seals, precisely. Then what happens is we know that the false Christ, but not the false prophet, was killed at the end of seals when the Lord came on Mount Zion. So now when we go to trumpets, tribulation time, <laughs> look at what we see in trumpets. In the first half of trumpets, where in Mark's, there was no mention of false Christ or false prophets. In Mark's first half, I mean, in Matthew's first half, which is first half of trumpets, you have false prophets, but you don't have false Christ. That's because he was killed. He was sent to the pit, just like Ezekiel 28 said. And just like we know, because it's where he's going to come up from. So you see, during the he was and then is not. So this is the time when the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. And the false Christ is not, but the false prophet is still there. And then what happens? Mid trumpets stand in the holy place because now the temple was built. It's not the mark of the beast. The actual temple was built. Now what happens? We know that the pit is going to be opened. Antichrist is coming back. Satan has been cast down, Antichrist is coming back, and false prophet is still there. And now look at what you see. Second half of trumpets, now you've got false Christ and false prophets again. It is absolutely incredible to understand. So now, false Christ was killed, now he's come back. False prophets with him. And what do we know about when the Lord comes at the end of Revelation, uh, in that final 14th year. Well, it said at the brightness of his coming that he was going to kill that wicked one who was the, the Lucifer, right? And here we see this is that battle in Revelation 19, him that came on a white horse, uh, vestiture dipped in blood. Uh, let's see, verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he that treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, the fowls of the great supper of God. Now listen to this. Verse 19 and 20 of Revelation 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. You see, what do we know? We know that Revelation 17 was the first one that put him in the pit. We know it comes back at mid-trumpets. And then we know from 2 Thessalonians 2 that when he comes back, it's Satan that gives him this authority that's going to have him go in there and declare himself to be God. And when he does, it'll be to the brightness of the coming of Christ, which is at the final 13th year of tribulation, at the start of the 14th year. And when he does, it says that he's going to kill him Right? Well, look at what it says. And the beast was taken. Now listen to this. 
and with them the false prophet that brought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that have worshipped his image. These both were cast now, look at this, into the pit. No, nope. they were cast into the lake of fire alive. Well, check out what Second Thessalonians says. Showing you this is the time of the end. Son of perdition, he will exalt himself because now, you see, now we can go into the temple of God because it was rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. But listen to what it says. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now listen to verse nine. Even him <coughs> whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Hello. Who's this? This is the false prophet. So it's even him or also him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Well, you guys already know. Who's the one with the signs and lying wonders? It's the beast out of the earth. And listen to what it says about him. It just said that he had this power, this authority through Satan. Whose working is after the power of Satan. And listen to Revelation 13, 11, which is about the false prophet. And I beheld another beast come on, coming out of the earth, which is Bohemoth. And he had two horns like a lamb. Listen to this. And he spake like a dragon. Hello. And he spake like a dragon verse 14 and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the first beast and what did he get them to do there it is cause rich and poor right small and great to receive a mark he's powered by who by the dragon that's why he speaks like the dragon so we're seeing here in second thessalonians this is clearly to the final from middish trumpets for the last two and a half years of the final great apostasy when the antichrist comes back from the pit gets to continue after in that within that battle against the two witnesses for two and a half years he's going to sit in there declare himself god through the power that his quote unquote father satan gave him as a copy of the father to the son with God, the father and Christ, the son. Who's going to be the one who ultimately sits at the throne after he defeats them. They're a copy. They're, they're a scandalous, wicked copy trying to imitate everything. And the reason these elites behind the curtain, these elites that worship Satan will willingly give them their power is because he's not only the Mahdi, you would think anybody would refuse the Mahdi unless they're Muslim. But we know that this group won't refuse him because they will understand he's Lucifer. He's their false light. And when the Lord is coming at the end of 13 years, at the end of the 13th year of, of, of tribulation, with that final 14th year, he's going to destroy the beast, Lucifer, even him whose coming is after Satan with all power and lying wonders. That is the false prophet. And it's precisely what we read in Revelation 19 when the Lord comes at the brightness of his coming. What? At the brightness of his coming. When he comes feet down from with as lightning from one end unto the other in his day. And when all the armies are gathered for this battle, even before it begins. Poof. False prophet and antichrist are now taken to the lake of fire the false light is destroyed this is that light that's trying to destroy us now guys this is that one trying to wreak and wreck havoc throughout all of us trying to take away everything trying to to say, oh, go ahead, have that drink. 
go ahead, have that extra drink. I'm not saying you can't have a drink or a glass of wine here and there. But if you know that you're going too far with it, you have to stop. You can't even have a sip. You just got to stop. Pray over it. Pray for help, the strength. And we'll pray with you too. For those doing drugs, the same thing. How on earth can you be a part? Can any of us have all of this and be blessed with all of this revelation? Incredible, incredible revelation. In a period of time where all of it is coming together. And willingly risk all of it for, for some pleasures or perceived pleasures. But they're all coming from Lucifer. The false light trying to entice you and all his little minions. Guys, look at this. This is a seven-year Shemitah chart all the way from the birth of Christ that we know we have in order, first of all, by the revelation of the final two sevens, but we also know it more precisely because of the Jubilee count from the days of Christ from Luke chapter 4. This is where it is. Do you realize the end of tribulation, the end of a 49th year, is the only place a jubilee can be? Do you realize that even if somebody believes in a seven-year tribulation, those seven years have to be the last seven of a 49-year cycle and then the final jubilee? So if you're listening to somebody that tells you the jubilee is in, I don't know, last year, well, then you got another 50 years to wait or 36 more years to wait. If you're listening to somebody that says, ah, the Jubilee is in is going to be based on all this, it's going to be in 2040. Well, then you got several more years to wait. We've shown it from scripture. We've shown it from historical documents of coins, of the Shroud of Turin, of all sorts of things with scripture. And it was the one from scripture that proved it. From Luke chapter three to four. This is the final Jubilee year. And if 2038 to 2039, trumpets to trumpets, is truly the final Jubilee year, which we know could be off by one year on this side or one year on this side in a historical count. Well, guess what? It can't be off one year on this side. It's already passed. And if it's off one year on this side, it throws everything off. Everything. The counts of Jerusalem, you see this? 70 years are done. Jeremiah 25. What happens when the 70 years are over? Then it will be the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance, that Jeremiah 25 says will be the time of the treading of the grapes. When did I just show you that was? The scriptures told us, Revelation 19, when the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the pit first at the time of the nations gathered together like Revelation 19, like Jeremiah 25, at the treading of the grapes of the wrath of Almighty God, and when he comes to begin it as lightning from one end unto the other, for the final year as Noah's. And the first thing to happen is the false light of Lucifer in the beast Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire alive. That happens after 70th year. What other 70th year is prominently connected to Jerusalem and God's people? None. There is none more prominent than this one that ends by the Feast of Trumpets of 2037. And according to all of that and everything we've been sharing over the years 
and everything I just shared with you now, there's your 14 years. Or your 13, and then the 14th, which he's here to fulfill and wipe out the enemy. Which means the 50 days are right here. They're in 2024, 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets of 2024 begins. Brothers and sisters, how can we, knowing what we know, not be ready? It would be a crime. If somebody needs help, that's why we have the form. Reach out and see if there's close by brothers and sisters. Send me a message in the form if somebody needs help and just needs a chat. I've been there. Believe me, I've been there. I was almost dead. You guys don't even know the hallucinations I had. The voices I was hearing as well as hallucinations, I was terrified. I wasn't terrified of what I was seeing, but what I was hearing was I was going mad. So I've been there, guys. I have absolutely been there. And the Lord brought me out, changed everything, and brought me into something I would have never, ever guessed in a million years. But I wouldn't change it. And you know what? I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't even be willing to go back and change what I did and what I almost did in di almost dying from it. I wouldn't even change that. Because I would be too afraid that if I was able to go and change anything, I wouldn't have received what I received. Do you see what's going on here? It's, you understand why people love the Lord and are so grateful for him? With so many, I don't mean everybody, but I mean with, with when such a big change happens in somebody's life, not just myself, but many, many people. It's because the Lord did something so huge for them and they recognize it. And they're so forever eternally grateful. And the evidence is in their life following that moment. Let's keep living in that moment. Let's not lose it. Let's be ready and watching, strengthening each other, and realize that it is the Lucifer enemy and his minions, with Satan as well, trying to take away our glory with the Lord. Let's not allow him. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray it strengthens you. I pray it gives you more insight to the end and the timings and the understandings of the enemy. I love you guys. Happy last Gregorian New Year of 2024. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now.